Hey, God, but this is episode uh, 49, season 8 of Radio Labyrinth. We're almost done. 2023, they seem, seem to go by really, really fast. And I hope you guys don't mind me doing this voice. I'm a little loopy right now. I got a little thing in my throat, which makes me think I got throat cancer, even though I probably don't because I've had the same thing before. But I'm obsessive compulsive, and that's just the way it is. I have all sorts of mental issues. Uh, we have one more show left. Yes, yeah, Steph's nodding. You, you know, she thinks I can't say her nodding, but she agrees with me. Uh, I'm sure she does. Um, we have one why more show. That? Why are you doing that voice, Slam? I don't know why. Hey, we'll get to that. Be quiet. <laughs> Be quiet with my trauma. Yeah. So this is our next uh, the penultimate. Is that the right term? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> penultimate Radio Labyrinth episode for 2023. We also uh, have a, a, a Patreon only show that'll be coming out uh, in conjunction with this. So if you're a Patreon member, you have access to that show, of course. And um, thank you. You know, next week we're going to it's pretty much going to be exclusively Christmas stuff that we talk about music and, and fun stuff. And I think Dustin has some uh, fun shit lined up for us. So I am looking forward to that. Um, we have a guest this week, Heidi Holliker. That's her name. And she was uh, one of the main characters in the movie Valley Girl. Right, Jeff? Yeah. And uh, she only did a, a small number of Hollywood films, but she did some TV and some commercials and she got real involved in um, special effects and things like that. And she's been involved in Hollywood pretty much her whole career. And what are we talking to her about? She has a brand new YouTube show that she's producing. It is called Scream and Cry. And uh, this uh, goth girl scream and her little puppet rat friend cry review horror movies and they do little uh, bits and stuff. There's another cast member and then there's a couple other puppets. It's it's funny. I watched it last night. I watched some of the prep stuff, the early release stuff, and then I watched uh, the uh, the review of The Fly. The editing and all that is really good on the, yeah. the, the they do a really good job weaving in and out of commentary with clips from the movie and stuff. It's really good. I still... That is the grossest movie I think I've ever seen with all the body parts falling off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even though now they could do it with CG, it's somehow grosser that it was done with special effects and makeup. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the Goldblum, he just crushed oh, yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 Brindlefly. Um, so, a uh, Patreon show that you can get at any level. You can come in at a dollar or, you know, on up and, and all that stuff. Go to patreon.com forward slash Tim Andrews and, uh, and sign up at any level. Uh, you can also sign up to be a producer at the $25 level. And if you do that, you get a T-shirt, some stickers and a doodle. And and uh, then you're credited. You are credited as a producer of this show. And I uh, want to thank our producers right now. Tim Slayton, Brian and Chelsea Smith, Jeff. Peterson, Jim Fortner, Terry Fuller, Chris Chandler, Roby Neely, Kevin Jackson, Mike D, and Matt Carter. Thank you guys very, very much. Remember that if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, subscribe, like, uh, leave comments. We're getting really good. This will be the third week in a row we actually read them. How about that? Consistency. Nice, huh? It's the devil. Yeah. If you're a member of Spotify or if you're whatever you wherever you listen to podcasts, Please rate and review us. And we do need to dig into those and see if anybody's left anything late. Um, we also have uh, we also have a merch store. And our friend Wally is going to tell us about his favorite Christmas song and an anthology series that he pitched. My favorite Christmas song is Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. It encapsulates the very essence of Christmas. It transports you to the birth of our Lord and Savior in that manger surrounded by camels and sheep and God knows what or who else, to the modern era where Santa Claus delivers presents to every good little girl and boy, even in the Middle East. I pitched Vince Gilligan an idea once. Get this, Walt Returns. Walt Returns in a horror anthology series like American Horror Story and shit like that. Season one, Walt and his sidekick, Mini Walter, steal Santa's reindeer. Walter goes nuts and starts killing grandmas with the reindeer. I know that's a stupid idea for a show, but how about this? Instead of reindeer, it's camels. Either way, we're killing some grandmas with reindeer or camels. We'll get one of those shitty modern whisper singing outfits to cut a slow and unlistenable remake of Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer that we can use in the trailer. Walt eventually gets caught and charged for his killing grandmas with reindeer rampage, so we'll need a lawyer. I think you know where this is going. That's right. Better. Call. Hal. Hal Wilkerson. Fuck, I'm good. Gotta run. Here's Dustin to tell you about the merch. 
got it's still going on our 10 percent off until the end of the year that's with code rlp123 check it out we've already, we've had some sales already so i'm glad this stuff's starting awesome. to get out and people are starting to enjoy it great oh, really people are buying it they are hey, tim set up a whole pickleball pickleball court in his backyard yeah <laughs> and if you if you don't mind pine needles and dog shit then you come over <laughs> and play Uh, we have uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. We have a guest joining us in about 15 minutes or so that we're going to talk to, um, you know, like we talked about at the beginning. But there's a very weird thing that happens this time of year if you work in an office place. People will bring in food, uh, cake, cookies, pies. I have pies probably not as often, but cake, you know, there's a piece of cake that's been sitting out on the shelf at WSB since I got here at noon. <laughs> And, Somebody's uh, going to eat it, though. You know they will. Somebody will eat it tonight. Yeah, radio people, we eat everything you leave later. And then there's a sack of cookies. And my problem with the Christmas cookie phenomenon is I love Christmas cookie. But there's these weird balls in there. You know, they're like white. They like think it might be a malted ball or some sort of, I don't know, cookie. Like a buck -eye, buckeye. Yeah, something like that. You buy, I bit into it as a dis disgusting cream. And then the other problem in the holidays is people put their, their mint cookies Oh, we made a little mint tree and they put it in the bag and then every cookie in the bag tastes like the mint cookie. And I don't want to eat chocolate chip mint cookie. I don't want to eat a Kit Kat cookie. I don't I, just keep the mint in a separate bag. It's like that time I, I lived in Tortola. My mom sent me a bunch of cookies and and bars of soap. No, oh, no. in the same box. Like soap. Every oh. cookie tasted like fucking soap. Oh, well. <laughs> Mint cookies are separate but equal. Let's just make that proclamation. They're cookies, so who fucking cares if they're segregated? They're not human beings. That's just... Yeah, I'd keep my Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies in the freezer, segregated yeah. from all the regular Girl Scout Yeah, cookies. that's where they belong. That is where they belong. Cold and ready to crumble over ice cream or just eat the entire bag while you're staring at all the other shit in the freezer. You ever <laughs> but even close the door, you just... <laughs> yeah, keep them right on the little shelf in the door so you can eat sure. them while you're looking for the other stuff. Uh, or not even looking for it. You just, hey, that's nice, that ice that's there. <laughs> Oh, I ought to defrost my fridge. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I wonder what's in the fridge. Salami. Okay, I'll eat that after I eat this whole. Sh there, you know, a serving size is probably three cookies, but a serving size is the whole. One, sheet. one sleeve. Yeah, one there. sleeve. Yes. And Steph, you had an issue. You you made cookies for everybody, and your cookie when you make things, they always taste good. Well, you know, know dinner, but, this was my first time making cookies since COVID. No, and you know, I used to I used to make them every. Christmas, tons of them, as you guys mm -hmm. know. I bring you guys some, and I always take them into work, and Pickle takes them to work, and it's like a whole thing. And I uh, I just decided, you know, I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to make some, not on the scale that I normally do, but I decided to make some homemade molasses cookies. Ooh, nice. Good. Yeah. So, There's the ones you can suck the molasses out when you're eating them. And you can think about the molasses massacre flood. Mm-hmm. I remember. Oh, I hope eating. not. I hope not. This was a different uh, recipe that also called for you to melt and drizzle white chocolate over them when they were done. So they did come out really good. And by the way, I don't understand how uh, a thing of cloves it, like that is this big is $7. Well, they got to really yeah. bring them over from Madagascar. So that's why it's so expensive. Some freaking cloves. Anyway, you got to jerk off a monk. <laughs> hey, we've already done that. Oh, sorry. Well, they, but anyway, they came you can't out. Jerk off a clove. <laughs> they were... Why are cloves expensive? They're the most disgusting things on earth anyway. People who put them in ham should rot in hell. You ever bite into ham and you, oh. Yeah, now that's stupid. But you got to have a little bit of a clove when you're making kind of like a spice based cookie. Sure, sure. But they're ground so, up, right? You're not biting. Oh, yeah, them. yeah, very ground. And you're only putting like a fourth of a teaspoon in. In a mm -hmm. whole you can just batch. grind up a, a, one clove cigarette into the yeah the that would be i don't know i mean it'd probably be about the same price because it's seven dollars for a pack of cigarettes so either way <laughs> i just i'd have to i'd have to do it but i've made all these cookies and i'd forgotten how much work this is and how you know once you start baking you're trapped in the kitchen you're yes. fucking trapped for yes. you you can't do anything you can't go anywhere because you have to babysit them and as like as they come out 
then you get some others back on the sheet to go back in. It's just a constant thing. So by the time I finished and the next morning, I'm headed into work and I've got my whole big tray of them. And I got to work and I just looked over at them and I was just like, fuck those people. They don't deserve these. Okay. I killed myself on this. <laughs> Me and Nancy Picklebottom are going to eat every single one of these. I I took them to my, my mother and father-in-law. <laughs> Actually, I just took the whole tray to them and so that they could share with their neighbors, too, because they've got some really sweet neighbors. So, yeah, I don't know. It just hit me like all of a sudden. Plus, we've had such so much staff turnover. Our staff turnover has been insane. So I figured the people that were working there Friday probably weren't going to be there Monday. So these would be all new people anyway. So really fuck them because I don't even know who they are. Yeah. They like temps. Oh, no, they're just new staff. Okay. Yeah, we we'll get new them. staff. We have like an entirely new staff every 12 minutes, basically. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you're like a radio. Yeah, <clears throat> Except yeah. we don't replace them. <laughs> you could do this work that we just fired this person from. Not me. I'm talking about other Oh, people. sure, sure. Yeah. No, no. We just, you know, we keep hiring, you know, the people that take these jobs are young people and they hate this job and I don't they're... really enjoy like all the work that I'm expected to do or the <laughs> ability or the fact that people tell me what to do and uh, why can't a robot do it? I told you guys they're smoking weed in the bathroom at my job. Smoking weed in the bathroom in a doctor's office. I can't tell you how many times I went to this job high over the many years that I've worked there. Back when I was young, especially in my 20s, I was high all the time. Did I ever, ever think about smoking pot in the fucking bathroom across the hall from a patient's exam room? Never. No. It no. never occurred to me to do, do that. Did they get fired? They, they don't know who did it. No. Why it was just like, why they smelled it. Not, why are these kids not vaping? I don't know, Jeff. That's what I'm saying. That's how much of a fuck they do not give. They could care less. Hmm. Yeah. So... Anyway, they tried to find out who did it, uh, but they scurried away before they. Scurry, 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 scurry. Uh, but I wanted to show you my shirt. Yeah. yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah, stand up, baby. Are you ready? Go, well, go real, stand go up. real I'm gonna, slow. I'm just going to pan down. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> nice. It's the Bible bonkers. Baby Billy Bible Damn bonkers. It. You just disappeared. Ah, now can you see it? Yeah. No. <laughs> anyway, it's Baby Billy's Bible bonkers. You get that off of Instagram? No. No? Where'd you T-Fury. get it? T Fury. T Fury. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just saw that was advertised on um on, on Instagram. Oh, this exact shirt? No. Different oh, one. Okay. No. No. Different one. But it's cool. You know, yeah. none, of that, none of that money's going to baby Billy himself. I think so. This is what I was <laughs> going to wear to uh, Dustin's brother's band's concert, but uh, oh, yeah. okay. my it sickness didn't... took me out. Oh, yeah. I couldn't make it either. Me and Dustin went. We had a good time. You went? Yeah. You didn't talk about it. <laughs> I sat backstage the whole time. You did? He was under the wrestling ring the whole time. Yeah. He would just goose him. He should have taken a chair and hit (laughs) hit Dustin's brother with the chair. Guys, are you reading the online comments? Gotta read some of these comments. I'm loving your guys' comments. You're reading your own comments? Yeah, they're really good. I worked hard on them. The secret is, don't read the comment cards. I came here to talk to someone about this, get some perspective. Turns out I can just read the fucking YouTube comments. Some comments from YouTube. Brian Jackson, 7525 says, I will never be able to look at a gingerbread house chimney without thinking about what Brian Cranston does to complete the decoration. Now, that's not Brian Cranston. That's my friend Wally. That's, <laughs> we have to call him Wally. Do you guys know what this is talking about? The yeah. AI thing that you did, it was pretty good. Thank you. There's a new one this week that I also think is pretty good. But yeah, it was pretty gross what Wally, a.k.a. Brian Cranston, does to the, uh, to the uh, Hallmark house. But he, you know, he had a reason. Uh, also on YouTube, uh, Roby Neely says, this is me not leaving a comment every week, which was responded to by Brett Perkins, who said, I have had my son type my comment this week. That way, different hands were used. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, over in the Radio Shack, Joshua Parsons says, here's my review of Leave the World Behind. It held my attention before it was entertaining. The plot was interesting and the acting was good. Not great. The ending left me with more questions than answers, which is hard to pull off and still be considered good. He gave it a thumb down. I haven't seen it yet, but I plan on watching it uh, this week. Yeah. 
I'm I'm seeing a lot of bad reviews about it. I'm I don't gonna, know why. I liked it. it. I liked it. I liked it. it. Fantastic. Yeah. I honestly feel like if you're a Mr. Robot fan, you're gonna yeah. like it. Yeah. Because it's got a, it's S mail all over. Yeah, it had Obama's fingerprints all over. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand it. No. Uh, and then on Twitter, it's Terry's life says regarding Trambles. Uh, Trambles is the weekly uh, audio only show that I do on Mondays. I managed to do two in a row. I should get a sticker uh, from this most recent episode. She says, this is pure, quote, ate an entire pie by myself because some Southern guy in Virginia Beach called me slim and quote gold. Yes, I told <laughs> a story of trauma that happened to me when I was a little fat kid at Virginia Beach with this redneck when I slam, I slam. <laughs> And I thought he was talking about my skinny friend, Matt, but really he was talking about me because I was big. And then I went home and ate a pie. <laughs> I know that's right, Terry. I also want to say um, uh, sorry to Terry because her yes. sweet little baby Jiggy passed away. Yeah, and sucks. I knew it's awful. God, it's the worst. It is. I hate it. It's been a shitty so, year for that for us. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I'm very sorry, sorry Terry. Terry. They yes. just don't live long enough. Oh, my. Oh, The Fly is about a scientist experimenting with human teleportation. And puking his guts out, turning into a fly. Fantastic. I'm in. Our guest this week, Heidi Holliker, is the co-creator and executive producer behind the new web series Scream and Cry. Heidi's diverse background includes production, post-production, writing, publishing, marketing, print design, visual and special makeup effects, acting and film distribution. In her early career, Heidi starred or co-starred in five feature films, 30-plus commercials, soap operas, music videos, television specials, including Fire Sign Theater's Eat or Be Eaten, and one of her favorite projects, Twisted Sister's Leader of the Pack video. I knew you'd <laughs> break your heart. Heidi has worked closely with such renowned filmmakers such as Guillermo del Toro, Ron Howard, Tim Burton, Ralph Winter, Wes Craven, Barry Sonnenfeld, and... Martha Coolidge. Some of the feature films she has worked on include Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Men in Black 1 and 2, The Nutty Professor, The Clumps, Cursed, The Devil's Advocate, and many, many others. Heidi is also known for playing the role of Stacy in the classic 1980s film Valley Girl. And now, without further ado, please welcome Heidi to the show. Heidi, hello. Well, lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Very fun. I watched your Dan Frischman interview and I thought it was lovely and beautifully yeah. well done. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have a fondness for people who who create and have been a part of our lives, especially in that magical decade where all of us were young people, except for Dustin, who's like 20. No, <laughs> 20, 20, yeah. ancient. My yeah. God. I was born in 75. It was my All life. right. You get a pass. You get a pass. You're still Gen X. But you know, he's sneaking out into the living room or maybe your parents went out drinking and let you home to babysit yourself on a Friday night, which often happened for oh, me. Oh, yeah. And HBO, we're going to watch Valley Girl tonight. I believe I watched oh. it at Jeff's oh. house. Oh, see, I was loving, I was watching Love American Style and uh, Love Boat. <laughs> we did that too. Too. I was yeah. creeping and I was creeping down the hallway to get um to because my babysitter was there, but I was creeping down the hallway of our apartment to to veer my neck over so that I could watch whatever laying on the floor. So, in, you know, inconspicuous so that I could watch some shows. The Donnie and Marie show was on and I <laughs> had to go to bed, but my mom would fall asleep on the couch. Like, <laughs> and I would come down. I'm like, I want to watch Donnie and Marie because Shields and Yarnell are going to be on. And they made me laugh. For some <laughs> well, my background is my mom worked on all of this show. She worked on, the Sonny and Cher show, the Jackson 5 specials, the wow. Osmond specials for Andy Williams. She discovered Glenn Campbell when she was working on the Joey Bishop show. Wow. And they needed a substitute. And she had already interviewed him and thought he was fantastic. So she got him on the next night, that that night. And he 
became like Nick Cage, literally became a star overnight. And right. um, so it was kind of in our in our blood to work, to work that way. So wow. what would your what would your mom do? My mother is a writer, but she was a talent coordinator. Wow. And then she was demoted to being a secretary for the producers of Sonny and Cher and Andy Williams. And she was a talent coordinator talent coordinator for Joey Bishop when she came out here from Boston. Did she work just with uh, Bob Einstein? My Super dad day. is a literary agent. My dad worked with bon Bob Einstein many, many times. And we were just right. talking about him the other night um, because I actually worked with Albert Brooks. So oh, we, wow. it's, it's all tied in. <laughs> that's that's awesome. The documentary. Yeah. My dad yeah. represent him as, represented him as a literary agent, Bob wow. Einstein. You're like the coolest guest we've had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. I'll take it. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about a lot of things, but we're going to talk right now about Scream and Cry, Horror. Great. I think we've get all Did yeah. you watch it a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We yeah. sold it. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Scream and Cry is my love. It, back there, I think you can see he's under the blankets right now. That's Cry. He's under there the blankets. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> Did you design the puppet? <laughs> no, Eddie Yang. We came up with the idea. And Eddie Yang, who I worked with at uh, such a varied um, career, but I worked with Rick Baker for um, 10 years, nine years. And Eddie Yang is one of the primo designers uh, for Rick Baker, for Stan Winston. And been, then he's been on his own for many, many years. And friends do do favors for friends all the time. So when I came up with with my business partner, Reed Shelley, came up with we needed a goth girl and we needed a sidekick. We weren't sure what it was going to be, a, a swoop or what. We said physical puppet because we both come from the physical effects world. So Eddie Yang took eight months because he was on other jobs, but he built the puppet for us. And then we had a fabricator fabricated, and then we got two puppeteers that initially came. They used to work for Henson, so they really know their stuff. And um, and then we got E.G. Daly to voice the puppet, that's and great. that's brilliant because yeah. she and I go back to Valley Girl, of course, mm. and we stayed friends. And then E.G. we then created another character, another character for her. that's a live action character named Baby Doll Delilah, that's in the show as well. Um, but back to, you'd asked me something about the puppet, I thought, maybe, I don't know. Well, we have an, uh, we have an affinity for puppets on the, on the show. Yes. Yes. As I do. And, and I grew again, all goes back to your family and your upbringing. My mother wrote for Sherry Lewis. Oh, so nice. I grew up with Lamb Chop. Oh, nice. And my mom once said to Sherry when I was a teenager, not realizing what she was saying, she said, you know, sometimes... Sometimes I take a stuffed animal, which still happens to this day. When I have something to say to Heidi and she doesn't want to hear it, I use a different voice and have the stuffed animal tell her what I want. <laughs> and she's telling this to Sherry Lewis, and Sherry is looking at her because she has a daughter. She's gone now, but she had a daughter named Mallory who was the same age as me and same problem, same teenage angst. And she just looked at her like, do you not? Realize we were talking to. So that was pretty cute. Hi, this my name's Red Box, and it's lovely to meet you. I used to live in a Red Box, so you, I can't tell you how many times I've seen Valley Girl. Oh well, I tell you, you are my favorite color. Just so you know. Thanks. I'm colorblind, so I don't know what color I am, but it's nice. You are an awesome lime green with very sexy ears and a dark green, dark green kind of quaff, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah. How about my nipples? What do you think? Well, I, if it were me, I like to cover mine personally, you know? Yeah, I um, probably should. It grosses people out. It's very... Um, it's not a gross know. thing. And nipples, we all have them. You know, we all have them. There was that Seinfeld episode, everyone showing nipples that they have them. But I think that it's a distraction. And I think you're so kind of fabulous that you you just throw in a little shirt and... You don't even need to show the nipples. I would definitely mm -hmm. do like a little cardigan to sort of offset your funkiness. You know, like a traditional cardigan would make people think, huh, he's super smart and he's super hip. 
You know, <laughs> just a thought. Not and this then show he every and week. He talks. And then <laughs> hey, listen, shut up. I want her to come on. I love this praise. Well, you know? Tim's had a very eventful day today. You did? Speaking, speaking with you. Oh, okay. About an hour ago, we talked to Tim Conway Jr. Oh, I love him. I listen to him every night. When he and I used him. to go watch his dad in rehearsals because I hung out at Sunny and Shear and CBS during all that time wow. when my mom worked there. So I, you know, any school breaks or earthquakes as we'd have. <laughs> did you ever 70. get to see him do? Did you ever get to see him do Dorf? Did you ever see um, I didn't because I think Dorf came after um, the Carol Burnett show. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. started yeah. it there. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I did get to see things like the when they did the carpet scene, you know, when she's um, when you she's were there? Scarlett O'Hara. Yeah. Oh, the Gone with the Wind. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Wind. And I I'd, I'd just hang out. I hung out on the laughing set and I'd watch them behind the doors and then I and my dad was knows George Slaughter. And again, my mother worked at CBS, so I could just go wherever I wanted. And there was this cool thing at the Laughing set that they had in a big area, you know, before they bring it into the stage where you you get on it and you climb and you sink and you sink and you sink. And I thought that was like the coolest thing at age 10 that I'd ever <laughs> seen in my life. And I'd go behind the little lap indoors, you know, and pretend I was Judy Carn or something. But <laughs> were you there yeah. during the was it was wasn't Rockford Files on CBS? Probably. Probably. Mostly, I don't you ever know. saw I James so, Garner. I was so into the comedy thing. So yeah. that was, you know, watching Cher rehearse, watching Chastity Bono come out, you know, and being held with the matching outfits. And At the end, yeah. yeah. All of it. And I would get, because they didn't want all of the presents that were, you know, coming through the office, they'd let the secretaries take them. So my mom would then just give them to me. And I don't know where they are now, but I'd get all the Sunny and Cher stuff all the time because they didn't want them. So it was a great growing up. And then, you know, I got into the industry myself. So did you get the asymmetrical sign that was their faces? My mom has that. That would be cool to have. Wow. My mom has that. But then, yeah. yeah, how long did it take you to get into the business? You you started out as an actress first? I did. I was, um, let's see, I, well, uh, an actress in school, always getting the worst because I wasn't blonde. Nothing gets blondes, but the blondes were getting the leads. And hmm. I, they would make me, they would make me a hundred three and three year old woman and put me in the background <laughs> where they'd make me a witch for some play i went to grant high school and my business partner in scream and cry and i went to grant high school together so we've known each other since seventh grade um so it's all pretty cool um and so i never was you know getting the leads or anything and then i um i started auditioning and i got a lot of commercials as a print for print, even though I'm only 5'4". And then I got the Miller's Outpost commercials. And those in the day were like the Gap commercials and uh, Jordache Jean commercials. And we'd shoot 10, 12 in a day. And it was really fun. And then I got I got 30 commercials. And then I got a soap opera called Young Lives, which was a teenage soap at the time. And I did some episodes on General Hospital you know, just little things here and there. And then I got a movie called Pink Motel, which is a comedy. And um, I it was with Phyllis Diller and Slim Pickens. Wow. And um, my mom came to California as a writer, wanting to be a writer. And she lived here and she was a housewife, not happy. And she was from Boston. And she would write letters to Phyllis with jokes and phyllis would send her back a five dollar check per joke <laughs> phyllis said oh this is when phyllis lived here and my mom lived in boston said you need to move here i will help you and my mom moved here and eventually my brother and i did as well and um she hired her as a writer comedy writer and then sherry lewis hired her as a comedy writer and all these then years later so 1980 i'm doing a movie called pink motel uh low, low budget California suite type movie 
um, there is a physical pink motel in the San Fernando Valley on San Fernando Road. If it's still there, I think it is. And um, there are four different stories that go on. And I'm the 15-year-old virgin who's going to lose her virginity that night. And it's a comedy of errors type thing. But Phyllis Stiller and Slim Pickens were the were the management of the Pink Motel. Mm. And when I was doing, right before I did my one scene with them, Phyllis looked at me and she said, Heidi Holliker, now, hmm, she hadn't seen me since I was maybe six and now I'm 20. Uh, any relation to Charlotte Holliker? And I said, that's my mom, except mm. she had remarried my dad, Stu Miller, who's an agent. And I said, yeah, she said, oh, oh, so wonderful to see you. And then invited us to her house many times and hear her play the piano. And um, so that that was kind of a thrill. That was my first movie. My second movie was um, Valley Girl. You know, it's Valley Girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Money that movie was in. <laughs> that movie was everything. I was probably, it came out in what, 83? 82? Mm-hmm. 83, yeah. Yeah. I was 10. And I okay. com- completely changed my vernacular. Really? Every 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 kid that or every girl I knew, we all like totally and gagged where did with you a spoon. Live? Where did you I, live? Detroit. Okay. It was it was probably kind of freedom in a way to be able to talk differently and act. Well, differently. It was so much fun. Yeah. And the movie, it was like that was a dream. That was a dream. All the yeah. the clothes and just how cool everybody was, and then the cage was. Yeah. Especially then, yeah, and you're just, yeah. you know, you're. I'm in fourth grade, but still, <laughs> no, tell. it's exciting. It's how I felt about Donny Osmond. It's how I felt about you know David Cassidy. It's the same kind of feeling. Um, John Travolta, all that, and it was. I was the only one in the film from the Valley, so I was. Yeah, that's bizarre that you're the only one in, in the entire Valley Girl movie that, yeah. that was actually I, from the Valley quite instrumental in um the vernacular and also i provided all of the wardrobe for us there was some other wardrobe that came in from the wardrobe folks but the valley girl song by moon zappa had come out in 82 i think yeah i heard that at a valley party and i thought how cool is that that was my that that was my response that was like zappa's only top 10 hit or something or his biggest charting single yeah, and then I think he regretted it. I read so many interviews, but... I'd heard an interview a couple of years ago with, uh, was it Rachel, the director of Valley Girl? Of the of the remake, Rachel Goldenberg? Was it Rachel Goldenberg? And she mm-hmm. was talking about all the stories that she had heard from the making of the original Valley Girl. And it was some something that happened at the party scene. Was it the cops actually show up at the party scene? Um, the cops, I don't recall the cops showing up. That was there. I was the one getting slimed with goopy slime goo. Um, mm. What we had is all of the extras on the film were guys that were students of Harvard Westlake, except it was Harvard, only Harvard at the time, which was an all boys Catholic school. And so we utilized them and maybe they were paid, maybe they weren't paid, I don't know, to hang around. And be uh, the party extras at, at the prom scene, and so they got um, a hold of some alcohol and they got pretty drunk. And so when it came to us leaving the the party scene, um, it was already set up that that Fred would put you know green goop all over me. But they started throwing everything. So and. Randy and Julie slid under the table and it was I mean, we knew that was going to happen, but they they were running after them and they made it a bigger. Um, I mean, it worked. It looked exactly like it was, you know, it was scripted. To, yeah, um, it was supposed to. But they got a little bit wild, um, <laughs> a little wild. So but it was it worked. So that's kind of bottom line. All that matters if it, if yeah, it worked. Got the shot. Yeah. And we did one shot on everything. Right. We had to had no second takes. We had. This much film, which you've probably heard in these stories, <laughs> mm-hmm. we would be um, when we were shooting the Randy, um, the Randy Fred, um, Julie Stacy in the car going to Mulholland Drive. At one point, uh, we the brakes, the brakes broke 
stopped and um, or that wouldn't stop. There was a brake issue and we um, were running out of film simultaneously. So it was that it was totally, hey, kids, let's put on a, put on a show routine. I mean, it wasn't it was it was really um, we had no permits you know, yeah, we were grill, grill of filmmaking, yeah. Such yeah. grill of filmmaking. And we didn't care. We just had the best time. So we just <laughs> laughed and laughed. The film uh, really kicked off the 80s in a way, uh, that, oh. that genre of film. And it was ripped off by so many people and, and to, to not be as good. I remember Siskel, and I, mean, I could be wrong, but I remember they both liked it. You know, and that's who. Oh, you Roger Ebert. Roger loved it, and in yeah. fact, when we had a screening five years ago, um, Roger's wife, Chaz, came. She lived about an hour and a half, two hours away, and she came to our cast and crew screening, um, and that meant so much to me. Yeah, uh, I got to know her because my uh, day job is Magnolia Pictures in distribution, and we were doing Roger Ebert's last movie, which is. Um, um, about about his struggles with not being able to talk and Chaz is a hero she is just an extraordinary human being and she got him through you know she got him through being able to still be him but have no ability to talk because he lost right. half of his jaw from cancer um life itself it's called I highly recommend it Many yeah pictures. I've seen that beautiful like film so uh, when it was up for an Oscar, which it did not win, I approached Chaz, told her about my moment with Roger, that when the film came out, we, you know, hand wrote notes to each other. And I hand wrote a note to him at the Chicago Sun, I believe it was. And he wrote me a note back and I have it somewhere and said, um, you did a great job. It's a really beautiful film. It was not traditional teen boob thing. It was great. I loved it. And um then years later, so that was that was eighty three. Uh, fast forward to like nineteen ninety eight. I'm doing a film with Rick Baker, who I worked for, and co ran his studio. And we were at a press junket with Roger Ebert for a movie called Mighty Joe Young, which oh, yeah. was a Disney film with uh, three uh, fifty Napoli gorillas. It was really a quite an undertaking for our effects team. It was. It was pretty cool. I love the film. You know, I don't think it did well, but I love the film. And Roger was waiting in line at the uh, Century City Hotel to, you know, interview Rick Baker. And I went up to him and I just told him who I was and that what he did to for me by writing that letter and sending it meant the world to me. And I was so grateful. And he remembered it. And then fast forward, you know, what it was five years ago when I saw all of the emails between Chaz and our publicist, and I just wrote her and just said, this is what your husband did for me, and and um, happened to be having a screening of Valley Girl, and I'd love for you to come. So everything is full circle. Everything yeah. is full circle. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that that happens in life. If you, if you, if you are in a, in a, a circle of people, and you do one thing, and then somebody does something for you, It'll all come mm -hmm. back to you in a, in a weird cosmic way. I don't know if it's weird, but it is cosmic. It is cosmic. Well, it's what I did the other night on Monday night for the Sting, uh, the Sting 50th anniversary. You guys are probably all familiar with the Sting, whether you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Seven Academy Awards, 10 nominations. And my dad is the agent to the screenplay writer. And so when he saw I was doing a big anniversary to do in April at the Chinese Theater, or 19 of our filmmakers, and again at Quentin Tarantino's theater two nights later, he said, hey, do that for, because I'm a producer, and and not an event producer, but I, I'm a producer, and you produce, you produce. And I said, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Talk to the, you know, been involved for the last three months with the studios and with um, Ben Mankiewicz, who's amazing, who moderated and got all the filmmakers, producers, who were alive and um, big heavy hitter, Mike Metavoy, studio exec, David S. Ward, the screenplay writer, Tony Bill, Michael Phillips, and my dad, Stu Miller, to be on the dais and do a QA. and a And this was just did, two, two nights ago, literally. Did, and, did they film that? Are they yeah. going to show it on I, I, classic movie or anything? Well, I hired a videographer. I have to do a bit of editing to make it politically correct. 
So right. I will be doing that. And um, it's really up to the guys. I mean, I own it, but it's, I I don't necessarily want to put it on social media. I think it's it's more for their private, you know, for pro- posterity. Yeah. Um, so however they choose to use it, right. you know, it, it will be all in good light. Uh, everyone will come off well. And we did photographs, but it's it's just uh, so ironic that everything comes around because, in it, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but in in a tiny nutshell, the reason that my dad even knew who this writer was, this nineteen year old writer, was because his car got hit uh, on a rainy day, and the man who, the man whose wife hit the car, uh, put a note on it with um probably saying it wrong, but with the license plate and the contact number. So my dad contacted the man. He was lovely. And uh, they stayed in touch. And he said, oh, you're a literary agent. I have a few scripts. He wasn't a writer, but he knew the neighborhood and he knew all the all the locals. You should read this. And it was Steel Yard Blues, which did get made by Tony Bill and Michael Phillips and Julia Phillips. And then they said, my dad warned me, said, they're going to say, what else have you got? Hmm. And he told them the story of the sting. And then it got to Redford and Newman. It got to um, Dick Zanuck and um, um, uh, Zanuck Brown. And ironically, I ended up doing a movie with Dick Zanuck with Rick Baker, uh, Planet of the Apes. So everything is, I mean, Dick's passed now, but everything is everything somehow comes around <laughs> and um that... and so we we actually found that man's daughter on sunday um who's an executive at warner brothers discovery and she came to the event and now we're friends so um because he's passed but because of that man leaving that note history was made wow you never know well that's wow. true and you got to work on the last Planet of the Apes movie that had phys- uh, physical effects in it. Yes, the Tim Burton oh. one. Yeah. Tim Burton and Ralph Winter, who is one of my favorite producers. Uh, and Dick Zanuck. I got to work with Dick Zanuck, which was a thrill. And we got to go to New York a couple of... Uh, we got to go to New York for Toy Fair, which I'm a big toy person. And you probably can't see, but those are all <laughs> movie toys back there. And... Um, very excited about making the Screaming Cry movie toys. That's what I, I, my partner says. Story, 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 and I'm like merchandise, merchandise, merchandise. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to. I want to talk more about um, Screaming sure. Cry for yes, sure. Please. But I have one more um, um, a question that's very important for me. Uh, when you made the video for uh, the Twisted Sisters, uh, oh yeah, of uh, Leader of the Pack, yeah. Um, did you get to work with Bobcat, and what was that yeah. like? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he hadn't lo- really broken through yet, had he? Well, it's ironic because two years before I was in Los, I was in um, where was I? I was in San Francisco visiting some friends, and they said, "Let's go see a comedy show." So I went to see a comedy show, and there's some little guy on stage screaming, and I'm thinking, "What the hell is this? <laughs> just like that, you know, <laughs> say something?" And I was, just, I was just, well, I don't get this. I just don't get it. So we left, and then um. Then got the gig, actually got uh, Leader of the Pack because Marty Colner, the director, knew my friend Charlie Randazzo because they edited a lot of 80s movies together, 80s music videos together. And he said, um, he met me and he was late at night and he said, and I was just, I guess, a little flippant, a little sarcastic. I don't know. It's not usually like me, but um, I guess it worked. And he said, hey, I want Dee to watch Valley Girl. And Dee Snyder watched it and said, I love her. Let's let's bring her. You know, it was very old fashioned the way things work. Um, and so he said, hey, I want you to be the girl in the in our video. Great. I love rockers. Let's do it. <laughs> so ah. we had four days and four of the most fun days ever. Uh, yes, Bobcat was Bobcat was so shy, which was completely opposite of the man that I saw on stage. He was so shy because I had to hug him, and he was just so nervous. And you know, I mean, he's a married man. It's not like he didn't know like women or want a woman hugging him, but he was just so sweet and so shy. I loved it, and um, got to hang out with the guys. Got to hang out on 
be cruel to your school. And ironically, my dear, dear friends who are makeup artists, like major Academy Award makeup artists, um, KNB effects, they were the ones doing the effects on this Alice Cooper, be cruel to your school, twisted sister video. So because I was there and I became friends with them, they said, hey, come hang. So I'm eating gummy bears with Alice Cooper in a trailer talking about golf and life and families. And I was like, this is good. <laughs> this is very good. Life is good. Life is, Life good. is good. And, and then the guinea- I, did, I also I did something really cool with Fire Sign Theater, which I loved. I did a an episode uh, special for them. Got to work with um, the guys from Fire Sign Theater. If you know them at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, that was very special. They did they did tie me to a stake and light fire <laughs> and then take a lunch break because I was yeah. a cheerleader being sacrificed to a plant. Um, you know, very fire sign theater. Uh, um, Phil Proctor is, is alive and he's a friend. But I realized that I really was tied to a stake and then they called lunch and we're shooting in the middle of the night. And I just got, it was just one of those, you know, you're not an important actress and you're just going maybe someone could help me. Right? <laughs> but I was in, I always wanted to be a cheerleader and I was in a cheerleading outfit. So I was, I wasn't unhappy about it. So, <laughs> Well, let's take some time to talk a little bit more about the new YouTube show, Scream and Cry, a uh, horror review. How many films have you done now? And we have long- done, yeah, we have done four full movie reviews. Um, one of them is for It. One is for Nosferatu, which is, super popular now because i think there are one or two major nosferatu movies coming out oh wow um at least one right now uh this month i believe uh with major players and we did um we did the fly the jeff goldblum gina goldberg the fly that was a lot of fun and we did rosemary's baby which we're we're just finalizing the edit now so those are four full movie reviews where you have you have our show open, you have all the little things, you have um, a moderator who is um, who is Scream, who's a 20-year-old goth girl. She lives in her parent, I'll just give you a basic, she lives in her mom's basement bedroom. Um, her, her mother, Queen, who is me in the, if you look at it, there's a big poster uh, behind Scream's fabulous chair which is hmm. of me in 1986. And I, my character, which you only hear me once off screen so far, my character was a B-movie actress in Hollywood, got knocked up by a gaffer. So just our backstory. <laughs> by a gaffer. He, you know, he didn't want anything to do with her, so she moved to the Midwest to live with her brother and raise the baby. And the baby screamed nonstop, so she called her Scream. And then as, as Little Scream was a little tyke, her uncle, who she adored, died. And when Scream, uh, when she had 20, Scream was really lonely, an outcast, not no friends, um, very smart, loves horror movies. And um, and she started doing a horror mov- movie review, just setting up a camera in her in her um, in her basement bedroom and a prop from Queen, her mom's old B movies had been laying there all dusty for 20 years. Enter Cry, who there's a one episode which is in black and white. If you guys have seen it, it's uh, called The Origin Story. And yeah, that was weird. great. Yeah. Thanks. That was, sure. we were really happy with that. And that's where they become best friends. Cry comes to life and says, you know, quit your bitching. I'm here. <laughs> you know, I can't yeah. take anymore. Let's, let's do this thing. And then her, um, her uncle, who used to be a local, Bio guy for car dealerships. He realizes there's a gig. Yes, he's a disembodied. Yes, he is dead. But mm-hmm. a gig's a gig, right? <laughs> right. So, so he he moderates the the show, and then we also have other characters. So we do full movie reviews, completely scripted, very funny. We also do some music videos with the characters. We do little shorts that we've been uh, we haven't put out a lot of them yet. We're doing as many as as we can possibly do. And then we have baby doll Delilah and Mm -hmm. Father Bill. And Father Bill is the very nosy neighbor who wears a big ass cross. I mean, 
like to hear to hear <laughs> and and um and a priest's shirt because he's a wannabe priest and so that's how he figures you become a priest and he's always kind of nosing in on what kind of evil doings maybe screams doing in her basement and he has a little thing for queen so we'll see where oh, that yeah. goes <laughs> um and then Baby Doll Delilah is um, is a hybrid doll slash human played by the brilliant E.G. Daly, who plays the voice of Cry. And um, we created that with her, and we did all the music video with her and Father Bill. And she actually lives in a dollhouse, so she she lives in the dollhouse, and then you see inside the dollhouse because she has been. Um, all of the all of the religious folk have uh, have um, vanquished her to this to this dollhouse. So there's all kinds of fun stuff that's coming up. So that's what sets it apart. There's tons and tons and tons and tons of reviews on <laughs> YouTube with people doing reviews. This is an actual show. So the review scripted kind of, show. Yeah, talk yeah. about this, but there's jokes and there's, a lot of talent. And there's real puppetry going on. Yep. And, and original and compositions all. by Bill, who's Father Bill, by Bill Propoco, who is mm -hmm. our composer, and he's brilliant. And then I have a wonderful, we have a wonderful DP who's been editing for us named Langston Ball. I have a makeup artist extraordinaire who's doing four different makeups and hair. Um, we're a really tight team. We're 11 of us yeah. doing this, but there are two of us who created it are the main writers, are the producers and exact producers. Can I ask how you guys are uh, choosing the movies that you're doing? Yeah, I do that, actually. Um, we kind of split, Reed and I split up the work. And um, uh, having come from the Rick Baker world, I have a pretty good sense. I'm not necessarily a horror buff, but I certainly have a tremendous respect for the horror genre. And Reed's come around like crazy. I mean, we we did go to monster palooza we were the um this june we were the featured panel which was awesome and we we go back and uh and that that was that was great and we continued to be involved with them and we'll be involved with other other uh conferences but i look at to start i probably viewed 30 films and um and view them at least twice because you really have to get a even if I've seen it before, you're looking you're looking for a through line and you're looking for comedy. Because in every horror film there's comedy somewhere. And we're both comedy writers. So we want to make sure that that, you know, that that comes across, which makes it a little bit different, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I there are probably ten that I love that I've done the outlines for that we will make into shorts short movie reviews so probably about three to four minutes as opposed to 12 minutes hmm. um i just watch them and know i know if it speaks to me basically hmm. um yeah hmm. okay I and we also we also want to develop our own read my partner is writing a horror film and we want under our umbrella to have horror films to have movie reviews to have merchandising to have just different elements so that it sort of has a very clear plan because we 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 want to accomplish a lot with within this universe that we've built. Tell everybody where where we can find it. Oh sure, so the social medias and all that. Yeah, thank you. Um, for Scream and Cry, our Instagram is on Instagram. It's simply at Scream and Cry Horror, and you will come to a page and you will see the links to YouTube or the link to our YouTube channel. And then you'll see about 110 different pieces there. Some are just photos, some are videos, some are behind the scenes, and then our bios. So you can learn all about all of us. Um, it says meet the talent. And I mean, EG Daly is such a star and she is the voice of, Pop, of Tommy Pickles in the Rugrat and Dottie in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, we, we and, reached out to her when when Paul Rubens passed away to see yeah. if she would come on. We, we didn't we didn't never work out getting her to come yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That was a tough time. They yeah, yeah. she's also um, in Better Off Dead, right? No, Better Off better. Dead. Yeah. Yes, she sings. Better she sang. Off dead. She's a oh, singer right. in Better Off Dead. Mm -hmm. that's uh, right. A movie called Fandango. Um, Let's see. She didn't. I did Joy of Sex. She did not do that movie. Uh, she did 
She has over, I'd say, 60 movies under her belt, if not more, maybe 80, and wow. sings on a lot of them. She is such an underrated singer. I was falling asleep a few nights ago, and she does this song that I absolutely love. It's called So Pretty. She shot the, the video about five years ago, and it's she does... Um, she has two gorgeous uh, daughters in their 20s. And the song is basically, uh, you know, why do I have to be so pretty? Can't you like me who I am? Mm -hmm. And so she has like a fake butt and and she, you know, has like makeup drawn as if, you know, they're going to cut up her face. And and but the song itself is so beautiful. And she has done so many of this because she records and edits her own music videos and shoots them so she's a multi multi talent and a very very smart human being and a very kind friend and and a colleague so i'm so proud to call her a friend as i am everyone on our team when will uh rosemary's baby be ready and, and released? we we were just having that conversation last night <laughs> and the, uh, yeah well, it's today, Wednesday. Yeah, uh, we are we are editing it now, and um, we need to uh, tighten it up because it's too long. He has his father's eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 at the end. Yeah, it's an it's an intense movie. I mean, it's a it's a cool movie to oh. to do a movie review Ruth on. Gordon, my God! Oh my God! I know, so awesome. I know. When we were shooting the one scene when when Ruth Gordon is saying. Um, once you come over and, and you know, have have some supper with us, I got some steaks and uh, I'm not doing it great. I got some steaks and they're ready to go. Come on over. And then I had E.G. as cry say that. But E.G. wasn't familiar with Ruth. So mm. I showed her the clip and she got it down. I mean, oh, she nailed, it. Oh, yeah. she yeah, nailed it. She nailed it. When we were rehearsing and we were coming up with Cry's voice, we um, we did a rehearsal and in person because it was all COVID, but we did an in-person rehearsal. And the, the voice of Cry was very much um, animation, not Tommy Pickles, but very animation kind of you know, commercial, you know, cartoonish. So we were on a Zoom with her because we had thought what do we really want and we wanted the angst of a 13 year old boy being in love with mm -hmm. his 20 year old best friend <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and so we had explained that to her before the zoom and and then we re re-emphasized re it and watching her brain work so it was like one two three about 40 seconds she gave it right back to us she gave the voice to us and it was like whoa that Yes, that's it. <laughs> and that's what's so amazing about working with such a brilliant talent is that they know their stuff and our composer knows his stuff, Bill Bill Procopo. And uh, Tom Pinto is a seasoned voiceover actor and he knows it. And Mimi Torres, who plays Scream, also built the set, designed wow. the set with me and designed, I, I was her prop person. She... Um, we did together uh, decided on the hair with our makeup artists. Together we decided on the wardrobe. Um, the, you know, really smart girl. And when she saw what I was doing with the set, because I am just not good with that, she said, "Okay, can I take over?" Said, oh God, please take over. <laughs> and then she had her dad build a, a little bed frame for cry for one scene um, where we have him waking up from a dream. And she built the dollhouse you see at the beginning. That's not that's not um, AI. That's an actual dollhouse that she physically built. So everybody is so involved and such a professional and so much fun and true labor of love, right? A true labor of love among everyone. Such a pure labor of love, and we are we are moving forward every single day, and we're right now for. For December and January, we've been focusing purely on, okay, we've done all of this. We have all this footage. Now let's lay out our business plan. Mm -hmm. Let's let's be business and figure it all out. And where where are the elements and who's storing that? What's you know? So we're we're an LLC and we're uh, being um, hopefully we're getting the uh, the uh, cop copyright from the Library of Congress. We applied for that. 10 months ago um not maybe not copyright it's a um trademark 
Trademark. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you. Are, are you looking to... You're on the team now. <laughs> are you looking to get, get this on a streaming service, or are you trying to stay... Yeah, it's we... We um we have a couple of majors that are, are waiting to meet with us. We just wanted to get all our ducks in a row and do that last um, Rosemary's Baby piece and make right. it really strong and also have some more shorts. We were really happy that we built it pretty much in three months and we've been, been slowly building um, and it is an organic build. We do We do put a little bit of money into making sure that that our site is being, funnel to other sites that would be like-minded um but we're at like uh, 5,600 uh likes um followers on our instagram which it goes up 50 a day which is fantastic Uh, i mean this is all new to us you know we come from film and television production me mainly film and reed shelley mainly television and animation so he asked me about four years ago on a at a high school reunion Hey, so I hear you want to produce. What what are you thinking? And then about six months later, called and said, Do you want to grab dinner? And I knew it wasn't romantic because he's married. And um, I'm like, sure. And then we started kicking around a few ideas. And this is the one we chose one or two, one of two. And we knew this this one stuck in the minute we started. And then we started calling our friends and um, saying, we need a puppet, Eddie, you know? For no money. money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how the best things are made. And then they start making money and you're happy about it. Heidi Holliker, thank you for coming on. Will you come on again? You have such a knowledge of. Oh, I would love cool to. Stuff. Oh, please, I... please. We'd love to have you back. Yeah, I'll come back with EG. I'll come back with Mimi, whoever you want back. I'll burn you. <laughs> like you as well, because yes. uh, this is this has been a, a joy and a lot of fun. And I want everybody to check out Scream and Cry. Just go to YouTube and type it in. We'll, of course, have a link. Uh, if you're listening uh, to the podcast, it'll be in the notes. But if uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, you know, just go and, and watch. And then, yeah, check out, you know, if anyone's ever not seen Valley Girl, where it's it's really a charming, charming yeah. keeper. So. If you're in our generation, and you haven't seen it. You have no excuse. <laughs> it's the best of those that genre of movies. Nah, Thanks. Last American Virgin. No, no I, it's nah. better than Last American Virgin. No, I know. Virgin. I'm kidding. And what we're about really Harvard? nice. We're not like our characters. <laughs> we're really, really nice. All right, everybody. Scream and cry. Make sure you go to YouTube right now. Subscribe and, and watch the videos. Oh, and, please do. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, you have guys. a great holiday. Yeah. We'll talk to you uh, sometime early next year if, you, if you're coming. I back. would love, yeah. love, love it. Thank awesome. you. <laughs>
Wow, she was a great guest. My goodness, what a lot of fun it was to talk to her. And we definitely would love to have her back. Jeff, thanks for lining that up. Um, guys, if you're looking for a gift that you can't get uh, anywhere else, just go to cameo.com and put my name in there, at Tim Andrews here, and I'll do a voice greeting for you or any of your family members or friends. Uh, check out the podcast, my radio show podcast. Last week's guest, Don DePetta and the director of Cirque du Soleil, Echo. That's available as a podcast this weekend, tonight, if you're listening on Saturday, comedian Leslie Lau and Paul Cowsill from the Cowsills. You know the Cowsills. They were the inspiration for uh, the Partridge family, and uh, they're still making music. They have a new Christmas album. Next week, Le Keith Stanfield and James Samuel, uh, among other things on the show. That'll be Christmas weekend. Uh, check out Trambles every Monday. Uh, I promise I won't bail on it. Um, if you know me, then that's a very tough promise to keep, but I will do my best. And I want to say, hey, you know, I was in that Aqua Teen episode, episode three. Uh, my buddy TJ Hassan played Blade. He did the voice in the first episode. And then Ronnie from Dancing is Forbidden. I was uh, going to say that the dude from the podcast was on this week. Yes, he was on episode four. And I'd like to get him on this show uh, too. And then uh, listen, if you want a cameo other than me, you can get... Uh, Mark Schrankel to do a cameo for you. Go to Mark001. Check out Who Buddies. They did the puppet, or he did the puppet. And check out Wade at the Art Gallery. You can see that art right here, the the link right here. Steph, what's going on with Barkville? Anything for the rest of the year? Uh, they're at uh, Chiringa in Alpharetta this Saturday. I believe it's from 11 to 2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's the Chiringa... Mexican restaurant. I don't believe that I will be there. I've got oh. some familial commitments, but yes. uh, they, do they have nachos? Uh, they do. Yeah, they've got good food. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, they a lot of cilantro. Nice. This, is how, this is how tired I am. I almost said, Steph, I really like your Christmas tree, and I'm like, that's fucking. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and Josh both, man. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was real for a second. Uh, <laughs> Da, 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 all right um yeah we'll talk more about shows and stuff next week but what a fun interview thank her uh for us jeff and yeah. uh well let's get her back on the schedule happy holidays everybody uh we got we got to talk about fargo at some point yeah we yeah. do we'll do that next week so yeah. fucking good yep i'm behind oh. this week until next week please remember to keep it, it, it can. Can. Can.